Allahul Azim. Respected ulama, respected elders, brothers and friends, I've been given the mammoth task of talking about our purpose of life. You know, unfortunately I'm no match to those who are previous to the beautiful, amazing recitation and the beautiful, amazing nasheeds. I've been given this task to talk about the purpose of life. So please bear with me. You're going to need your thinking caps on. I need to be try to follow and listen carefully, inshallah, and there will be some benefit, inshallah. So we, we should everyone should really pose this question to themselves at one point or another. What is my purpose of life? Why was I created? Why am I on this earth? Normally we think people who were not Muslims before, reverts. And then they become Muslim. They, they probably ask themselves this question and then they found Islam. But even those of us who are born Muslims, we should ask ourselves this question. We should question ourselves. You may be at different points in time, but you should question, why are you on this earth? What is your purpose of life? There's many different angles that would take this topic, but I want to talk you through a logical understanding. So let's, let's, I'm going to talk you through and let's walk through the thought process of someone who has come to the final conclusion that yes, there is a purpose in life. Yes, there was a reason and there was a purpose for why we were created. Yes, we were not created in vain. We were not created for no reason. We were not created useless. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا Allah did not create the heavens and the earth in vain. Allah did not create the heavens and the earth and whatever it lies in between as لَاعِبِينَ as a play. This is not a play. Allah, if, one, if Allah wanted to make it as a play, He would have. لَوْ أَرَدْنَا أَن نَتَّخِذَهُ لَحْوَى if Allah wanted, then He would have done it. But Allah says, مَا خَلَقْنَاهُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Allah created the heavens and the earth, and whatever is in between the heavens and the earth, for بِالْحَقِّ for a true purpose. For a true purpose. So how do we come to this conclusion that there's a purpose? So we start by looking at the creation of Allah. You know, we look at the sun, we look at the moon, we look at how night comes, how day comes, we look at the stars in the skies, we look at the ocean, the vast, the depthness of the ocean, we look at the mountains, how great and massive they are, we look at the animals which are scattered on the land, we look at the creatures which are swimming in the oceans and the seas. We look at ourselves, how intricate we are, how profound our creation is, how amazing everything is, how precise it is, how perfect it is. And then we come to a conclusion that you know what, all of this was not created just like that. It wasn't just created for no reason. There was a reason behind it, there's a purpose, there is a creator. There is someone out there, there is an entity out there that created all of this for a reason. And you know Allah talks about this in the Quran in many many a place. In fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa akhtilafi layli wa nahar Indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alternation of night and day and in the sun and the moon and the seas and the wind, Allah mentions this in the Quran. Allah says, Inna fi dhalika la ayat li qawmi ya'qilun, li qawmi yatafakkaroon. In all of this, there are signs for those people who ponder and who think. But the problem is nowadays we don't ponder or think. You know, living in London, we don't actually appreciate the beauty of this creation of Allah. You know, we look outside, we see a typical London day, dull weather, grey, miserable, raining. You know, we don't really appreciate the sun, the sunset. Or we're just too busy in our lives, 
going to work, family, commitments, we don't really appreciate. So we should take moments out in our lives, in our time, and just glare, and just think about the creation, just look at it, stare at it. Say, subhanAllah, what is this creation? How beautiful it is. You come to the conclusion, Allah says, رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا Oh my Lord, oh my Creator, you have not created all of this in vain. You have not created all of this for no reason. So the first step we start, or anyone start, is by looking at the creation of Allah. And then, you look at the creation of yourself. Allah has given you eyes. He's given you ears. He's given us a nose so that we can smell. Allah has given us hands and feet. Allah has given us intellect. Allah has given us a heart so that we can feel emotions. Allah has blessed us with so many, so many blessings. And we only really appreciate these blessings is when we see someone else who does not have this. Someone who's blind, someone who's deaf, someone who doesn't have hands. When we see them, we say, oh, I'm so lucky I have this. But otherwise, we don't really appreciate. And then on top of that, Allah has given us these physical blessings. Allah has given us food and water. Allah has given us oxygen and air so that we can breathe in. Allah has given us loving families who care for us. Allah has given us shelter and roof over our heads. You know, we can't count the blessings of Allah. Allah says in the Quran clearly, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you were to go about counting Allah's blessings, لا تحصوها, you can't. It's impossible. You can't enumerate them. You can't count. They're too many. They're infinite, in fact. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Indeed, Allah he is the most forgiving. He is the most merciful. So we, we come to the conclusion that there is a Creator. And this Creator has blessed us with so much. So that we then, as human beings, we have this urge now to thank the Creator. All human beings, any decent human being has this quality, this characteristic in them, that they want to thank someone. If someone does you a favor, you want to thank them. This is a characteristic of any decent human being. For example, you're on the road, you're in your car, and your tire, you know, you have your tire inflates, or there's a burst in your tire, and you're stranded, someone comes passing by, and they offer their help, they help you fix it and repair it. If you were to now just turn away, walk away from this person without thanking them, without appreciating them, then you would be an indecent person. That would be just, what would that be? Rude, indecent, inappropriate. That would be not good whatsoever in any language, in any culture, in any religion. So as human beings, we have this universal, certain things which are universal. So we have this urge to show gratitude and to show thanks to those who have shown favor upon us. So similarly, this creator out there, he's given us so much. He's given us so much. We feel this urge that we want to thank him. We want to show gratitude towards him. You know, even people who are not so religious, when something good happens to them in their life, when they're blessed with something, you know, sometimes they, what do they say? The first words they say, I thank God. You know, you see it all the time, you know, sports people, athletes, they've achieved something great, they've got a gold medal in the Olympics, or they've won the championship, or they've broken a world record. If they're being interviewed, what is the first thing sometimes they say? I thank God. All, all thanks is for God who gave me the, the ability to do this. You heard this, even though they might not be religious. So there is that natural inclination to thank the Creator. But then, you want to thank this Creator, you want to love this Creator, you want to appreciate this Creator, you want to obey this Creator. But the question 
arises in your mind. How do I reach out to this Creator? How do I thank Him? How do I fulfill what He wants me to fulfill? How do I fulfill His purpose? In fact, what is this purpose that He wants me to fulfill? What is this purpose of life? So these questions are now ringing in your mind. Let me bring it from another angle. As human beings, you know, we manufacture things, we, we make things, we produce, create. Car manufacturers, they make cars for a purpose, so that these cars, they drive. A builder makes a house for a purpose, so that the house, people live in this house. Similarly, we, our creation, we are made for a purpose. Now, if this car breaks down, then the person who owns this car is going to go back to who? The car manufacturer and say this car has broken down, it's, it's not fulfilling its purpose, can you please help me? So similarly, if we understand that we have a purpose in life, and we want to know what this purpose is, who do we go back to? Who do we refer back to? Naturally, we refer back to the Creator, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Creator, and we ask Him, O oh, Creator, what is my purpose? How do I achieve this purpose? But then you think to yourself, you know, I'm 15 years old. I'm 20 years old, 25, 30, whatever, how old you may be. I've spent my whole life, 20 years, 30 years, heedless of my purpose. Unaware of my purpose. I've spent life doing what I want, partying, sinning, just doing what I want. I've gone, I have been violating my Creator. I've been violating the reason why I was created. 20, 30, 40 years, how, how old you may be. And then you think, however, my Creator, He hasn't punished me for that. I'm still alive. He hasn't punished me for that. Let me give you an example. We buy a computer or a laptop. It breaks. It crashes. It's not working. What are you going to do with it? You're going to try again and get it repaired. It still doesn't work. What are you going to do? You're going to throw it away. You're going to get rid of it. Similarly, like in the old days, people used to purchase, buy and trade in animals. Someone buys a cow for milk. They buy this cow because they want to milk the cow and benefit from its milk. The cow no longer gives milk. What is the farmer going to do with this cow? He's going to slaughter it and maybe make use of its meat and then get rid of it. Similarly, with Allah, our Creator, we violated the commands of our Creator. We've been heedless. We've been unaware of, the, of our creation, of our purpose of creation. However, our Creator, He hasn't got rid of us. Our Creator, He hasn't chucked us away. Our Creator hasn't punished us. <coughs> For example, say one of the terms of our purpose was not to lie. Every time we lied, there wasn't a lightning that come from the sky and that zolted, that bolted us and made us thunderbolted us and punished us. Every time we stole, our hands didn't get chopped off. So every time we made violation, we violated, we went against our Creator. Our Creator was merciful. He was forgiving. He let us go. He let us go. He gave us respite. This is not what humans do. Not what humans do. Humans can only be merciful to a limit. In, for example, you employ someone and their contract says, You've got to be at work at 9 o'clock every single day, five days a week, Monday to Friday. So your employee decides to come in at 10 o'clock. You're going to give him a warning. The next day he doesn't turn up. Another warning. The next day he comes at 12 o'clock. You're going to get rid, right? He's useless. He's not fulfilling his obligation. He's not fulfilling his purpose. You're going to get rid. <coughs> But us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we've been violating our Creator 
for so many years, yet he's been showing mercy, after mercy, after mercy. In fact, his mercy is immense. His mercy is unimaginable. So what, where, where have you reached? Just, let's just step back here. So we, we looked at the creation of the Creator, and we came to the conclusion that there is a Creator. Then we felt this urge to thank the Creator. We feel, felt this urge to thank and show gratitude to Him. And we want to fulfill His purpose. But then we realized we've been so bad for so many years. And we understand that this Creator has been so merciful. But then you still persist. And you think, I want to get to this Creator. And I want to ask Him to show me the right way. I want to ask Him. I want to change my life. And I want to commit myself to this Creator. So you persist with this endeavor. You want to you wanna have guidance, but you need help. You don't know where to start. Where do I get this guidance? Where do I find the straight path? So you ask your Creator, guide me to the straight path. Oh Creator, oh my Creator, please take me on the straight path. Show me the straight path. And then you realize, you're not the only human being in this world. There must have been so many people before you who've gone through these endeavors. So many people before you who must have asked for guidance and possibly been given this guidance. So you ask your Creator, O oh Creator, give me the guidance, the guidance that you gave to those who've been before me and the, those who are with me now. Give me their path. Those whom you have favored. And then you realize, you don't want to be one of those people who's given guidance, who asks for guidance and is then given the guidance and then you throw it back to your Creator and you say you don't want it. You don't want to be one of them. Imagine how angry your Creator will be. You ask for guidance, your Creator gave you that guidance and then you turn around and say, you know what? I don't want this guidance. I'm better off doing what I, what I, what I want. So you don't want to be like that either. So you ask your Creator, Oh Creator, do not make me of those. And then you ask your Creator, you realize there are people out there who ask for guidance, who are given guidance, but when that guidance is given to them, you know what, they don't like all of it. So they mix their own whims and their desires with this guidance, and then they continue with their life. And then they become lost. The people out there, they know, they know what the guidance is, they're given the truth. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really fall into their, how their lifestyle is. So they mix it up, change it about, and then they continue their life. Unfortunately, they're on the wrong track. So you ask your Creator, please don't make me of those people who are give, given guidance and then mix it up with their own whims and desires. And then that leads you to the guidance and to the straight path. Now, there was actually a reason why I went in this order. This is the order of actually the Qur'an. It's actually the order of one of the surahs of the Qur'an. Does anyone know what surah I might be referring to? Oh, the mashallah. Surah, surah Al-Fatiha. The first surah of the Qur'an, you know, Someone is to recite the Qur'an, look at the translation, Surah Al-Fatiha, and he really should hit you. How does this link to Surah Al-Fatiha? You know, you start, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is to Allah, the Lord of the entire world, the universe. So you, you want to thank Allah, you want to thank the Creator. You appreciate His creation, you appreciate His favors, you want to thank Him. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim The most merciful, the most kind You realize you've left, you lived your life in sin You've lived your life in a heedless state, unaware But yet your Creator has been so merciful He hasn't punished you, He's let you go Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim 
the most merciful, the most kind. Maliki yawmiddin. But then you realize, you're, you're bright enough to realize that you can't just take, you can't take advantage of His mercy. There will be a day where of consequences. There will be consequences for my actions. In life, anything we do, there are consequences. We teach this from a young age. You know, I teach in a school. We tell our students, you do this, there are consequences. You don't do your homework, there's attention. So there's consequences, right? So similarly, you understand, as human beings, that if you go against your Creator, Maliki Yawmiddin, there are consequences. He is the master of the day of judgment. So there will, there will be a time, there will be a day where you're going to have to face up for your actions, face up in front of your Creator. Maliki Yawmiddin. You realize He is your creator and only you worship you worship only Him. Oh Allah, we only worship you, only you. And we ask you for help. Oh Creator, we need your help. We need your assistance. So we only are asking you, we're not gonna ask anyone else. And what is this help and assistance we need? More specifically, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Our Creator, guide us to the straight path. Take us along the straight path. Take our hands and take us and show us the straight path. إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ And then, صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ The path of those on whom you have favored. The path of those on, on whom you have favored. So those people before us who have gone and who are on the straight path and who Allah favored, Oh Allah, please give me their path. I.e. the path of the prophets, the path of the pious, the path of the, of the righteous, the path of the truthful ones. إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Oh, our Creator, give us the straight path. صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ the, one that, the ones that on whom you favored, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ Oh, oh Creator, do not give us that path of those whom you have become angry with. I.e. those whom you gave guidance, they took it and then they threw it back in your face. Oh Allah, don't make me one of them people. وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ And oh my Lord, oh my Creator, do not make me one of those who is gone astray. Because you gave me guidance, and then I mixed it up with my own desires and my own whims and my own thinking. And then that person went on the wrong path, track and they went astray. So all of this logically, you know, I, I didn't, when I went through this logically, I didn't say to anyone, become Muslim. Become Muslim. We just, we went through this logically. And this is also shown in the Quran. And if we come to this conclusion that we need to be on the right track, the right path. And we, we, there is a purpose in life, and we need to fulfill this purpose of our, of our life. What is this purpose? Allah mentions in the Quran that I haven't created jinn or humans except that they worship me. So this is our purpose in life, we worship Allah. Now whenever we had the term worship, ibadah, what does our mind tend to go towards? Oh, we have to recite Quran. We have to pray, fasting, make Umrah. Yes, well, of course, these are major aspects of worship. But in fact, as Muslims, every aspect of our life can be worshipped. That is a reality, but this is something we, we don't think about. The fact that we go to work, we earn halal money, and we put that money and we provide for our families, this is worship, it's worship. You know, the fact that we eat, we eat so that we're given energy, so that we can pray, so that we can fulfill our obligations, worship. The fact that we sleep, the Prophet ﷺ said that your body has rights over you, give your body some rest, this is worship. So everything is worship, it's just a way we think about it. We need to be deep thinkers. 
So this is how we can tackle this issue of purpose of life by thinking about it in this logical way. Now, another way we can think about it is thinking about the akhirah, the hereafter. When I was a young person, growing up, you know, teenager, probably up to no good, one of the things that really hit me and, you know, kind of diverted me to the straight path were, was the Qur'an. And those verses in the Qur'an, which talk about preparing for the hereafter, you know, they really hit me. The likes of Surah Al-Takathur, Surah Al-Qariya, Surah Haqqa, Surah Zilzal, Surah Al-Qiyamah, we just, we just had a recitation of. These surahs, when you, when you listen to them and then you look at the meanings of them, they really, they, they really hit you. They should hit you. They are eye-openers. They ring alarm bells in your brain. And they ask you, what, what have you done? Imagine you were to die tomorrow. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Have you fulfilled your obligations to Allah? Have you fulfilled your purpose of life? So this is something which I really encourage each and one of us to really think about. Because you know what, as human beings, we spend time in this world, we're so busy in our worldly obligations, we forget that we're really on a journey, you know, we're on a journey. And this life is just one of the stations of this journey. You know, we, we spend some time in the womb of our mothers, nine months. That was the first part of the journey. And then we come out the wombs of our mothers, and when we are babies and we're toddlers, and then we grow up to be youth, and then we become old and frail. That's another part of your journey. And then you pass away, you're into the grave. That's another part of your journey. And then you're resurrected. That's another part of your journey. And then you face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's another part of your journey. And then it's either Jannah or Jahannam. Paradise or Hellfire. And that's your final stop. That's your final station. And that's the last part of your journey. So this dunya is just a station. No, it's just a small, it's temporary. But we live like we don't know this. We know this, but we live like we don't want to know this. You know, we just live our life as if nothing's going to happen, it's all fine, it's all nice and rosy. We don't actually think about death. Have I actually prepared for death? If I was to pass away tomorrow, if I were to meet Allah tomorrow, would I be in a good state? Am I able to answer the questions in the grave? Am I able to face up to Allah and answer the questions, the questioning of Allah? You know, we don't actually think about this, unfortunately. This is something we should think about. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ أَوْ عَابِرُ سَبِيلٌ be in this world as if you are a stranger or you are a traveller. I.e. do not become too comfortable in this world. Live as if you are a foreigner in a foreign country. You're only there for a few moments, then you pack your bags and then you're back. So we need to live in this life. Yes, we live in this life. Allah says in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَعَيْشِ We have given you in this life means so that you can live. And you can live well. We have obligations. We have a family to take care of. We've got responsibilities to fulfill. We all got to work and earn an income. But ultimately, whatever we do, whatever obligations we take on, should not hinder our progress for the Akhirah. It should not be a barrier in making progress in the hereafter, which is the real life. وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ The hereafter, this is the real life. This life is just but a few moments. It's a deception. So we shouldn't go running after this dunya. So 
So then that leads us. So we should talk about the Akhirah. And maybe during the group discussions that we have, and overnight if you're staying, maybe talk about the Akhirah. Think about it. Maybe open the Quran to them, the surahs that I've mentioned. And read the verses. You know, Allah talks about Akhirah in lots of detail. Talks about death. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Allah reminds us three times in the Quran that every soul is going to taste death. No matter who you are. You could be the president, the king. You could be the billionaire, millionaire. You're going to taste, you're going to have to die one day. That's, that's one thing which is 100% going to happen. You know, there's many, many possibilities in life. One may get married, one may have children, one may... This might happen, that might happen. These are all possibilities. But one thing is just certain, is that we're going to die. Have we prepared for death? Have we softened our hearts for death? You know, we, if we look into society today, we look around and we have many problems in Muslim society. You know, you've got people that drink. People are intoxicated themselves with drugs. People who are involved in, in riba, in haram. You know, people disobeying their parents openly. You've got many, you know, unfortunately, you've got many problems in society today, as a Muslim society and community. People don't pray, people are not fasting, they're openly eating in Ramadan, you know, all of these things. And you ask ourselves, why, why do we have these problems? You know, it's not just a problem of ignorance. Everybody knows you need to pray. Everyone knows drinking is haram. Everyone knows drugs are haram. So I mean, it's not just a problem of ignorance, although ignorance is a problem. But that's not the only problem. We have a problem where our hearts are not soft. Our hearts are too polluted. We haven't softened our hearts so that we can then listen to Allah's commands and His rules and His regulations and then obey them. Now Aisha radiallahu anha, she mentions that لو أن أول ما نزل من القرآن لا تشرب الخمر فقالوا والله ما نترك الخمر أبدا Aisha radiallahu anha, the, the beloved wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she says that if the first verses in the Quran were don't drink, don't commit fornication, don't commit adultery, don't commit zina, then the people, they would not have been ready for this. They would not have been ready for this. The Sahaba I'm talking about. The campaign, they would not have been, if these were the first things to be revealed in the Quran, then no, they would not have been ready. وَلَكِنْ كَانَ أَوَّلْ مَا نَزَلْ سُورَةُ الْمُفَصَّلِ However, the first verses which were revealed, the first surahs which were revealed, were surahs in which there is mention of Jannah and Jahannam. There is mention of death. There is mention of the oneness of Allah, of who is Allah. <coughs> These were the first things to be mentioned. You know, if you look into the Makki ayahs, the Makki surahs, those chapters which were revealed in Mecca, when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, the early surahs, most of them, in fact all of them you could argue, they don't, none of them have any rules or any regulations, any rulings, no ahkam really. They all talk about Tawheed, about Risala, about the messengership, they talk about the Akhirah, about, da, about death, they in great detail paint pictures of the Day of Judgment. You know, they, they, you can imagine the scenes by reciting the Quran and by looking at the translation, you can imagine the scenes on the Day of Judgment. You know, When this Iman had become firm in the hearts of the companions, نزل الحلال والحرام Halal and Haram came down and the people were ready to obey. سَمِعْنَا وَطَعْنَا The people were ready to listen and obey. So, one of the problems we face is our heart is not attached to our Lord. They're not soft. They've become rusty. They've become rusty. You know, I'll give you two examples. We finish off with these two examples. Around about the 1930s, the US government, government of the United States of America, you know, super power at that time and even at this time of the world. They wanted to make a rule 
a law. They wanted to enforce a law. They wanted to prohibit the consumption of alcohol. They realized, you know, alcohol is creating evil in society. You know, it's creating havoc, chaos in society. So we want to ban the consumption of alcohol. This is true, you can research this, in the 1930s, it's true. They, the government of the United States wanted to ban alcohol. So they spent millions of dollars in trying to enforce this rule. They spent m money enforcing it. They had police out there. People were sent to jail. In fact, people were even, were even killed. Number of years passed by. The USA, they analyzed the situation and they concluded that, you know what? The situation is probably worse than before. It's worse. Why? Because people are now secretly making, manufacturing alcohol and this is making it unhygienic, this is creating diseases, this is creating illnesses, and this is making the situation worse. So they decided to uplift the ban on the consumption of alcohol. They decided to scrap their plans and they said, okay, alcohol is fine, it's allowed. So they tried, they tried, they spent money, but they were, at the end they were unsuccessful, you could say they failed. Let me take you 1400 years previous. The verses of the Qur'an come down that إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ The verses of Surah Al-A'raf إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنْصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِجِسٌ مِّنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَاجْتَنِبُوا That indeed, khamar, alcohol, and gambling, and all of these other vices are evil. They are evil, they are amal of shaitan, they are acts of Satan. فَاجْتَنِبُوا so you have to now refrain from them, you have to stay away from them. Now Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, a great companion, he narrates that he was actually with the companions, some of the companions at this time, and he was serving them alcohol. By coincidence, he was serving alcohol. These verses came down from Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, Prophet Sallallahu then delivered the message to the companions. The message now started to echo in the streets of Medina. The news reached Anas ibn Malik. What was he doing? He was serving alcohol. He says he heard these verses. He dropped his jug of alcohol. He dropped it. Immediately he dropped it. He didn't say, you know what? One more sip. You know what? Last, last sip. There were actually people who were about to sip, take a sip from their cups. They, again, they immediately dropped their cups. In fact, there were some who had actually drank some alcohol. They induced themselves to vomit in order to take that alcohol out of their systems. Can you believe that? It's just immediate obedience. Immediate. Why? The question is why? Their hearts, they were clean. Their hearts were ready to receive the messages of Allah, the rulings of Allah, and then that's it. Sami'na wa ta'na. We listen, we obey. So this is something we need to ponder on. Our hearts. Are they ready? We know, we know what halal was halal, but are they ready to accept the messages of Allah? The commands of Allah. Prophet ﷺ, he says, In the That their hearts, they become rusty. They become rusty, just the way iron becomes rusty when it's met with water. So the companions, you know, they didn't just sit around and, okay, say, okay, the hearts become rusty. They asked, Ya Rasulullah, what's the cure for this? They wanted to know. They didn't sit around and say, okay, the house become rusty. They wanted to rectify themselves. They had that zeal. Okay, the hearts have become rusty. How do we purify our hearts? This Prophet وسلم, he told them. He said, Dhikru kathri al-mawt, kathratu dhikri al-mawt, wa tilawatul Qur'an. That abundantly remembering death 
and the recitation of the book. SubhanAllah. So this is, I think, this is what we want to do today, I'd say. We want to soften our hearts. We want to kind of remind ourselves of why we are here. We remind ourselves of the Akhirah. We remind ourselves that one day we're going to return to Allah, stand in front of Him, and we're going to be reckoned in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, questioned. And react we do. Every good we do, it's going to be brought forward. Every evil we do, it's going to be brought forward. So we need to soften our hearts. We need to remind ourselves of why we are created. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to do, to do so. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala soften our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon us and forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the straight path. Amin. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Very thought provoking, inspiring. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to practice on everything we heard. So while I was talking, and what were we doing? While we were sitting, what was the activity we were doing? Zakaria, what were you doing? Listening. Listening, okay? So there's talking. And there's listening. So most of us, when we were, well, all of us, we were sitting here and we were listening. What happens next? What happens after listening? Practicing. Okay, mashallah, that's correct. So we listen. الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ وَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنًا We listen and then we practice. But if you break this up a bit, if you break this up, Let's look at the, the normal process. Uh, practically speaking, what happens is that when we hear about Allah, His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about Deen, we listen. Um, but then, what do we do next? How do we practice? What do we start? Where do we start from? There's something called tafakkur that takes place. That has to should take place when we listen. What does listening mean? Listening is a very, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a art, it's, there's a lot to it, okay? That's has to be thinking involved. Thinking, understanding, belief, all of these things. So tafakkur, ref, reflection, is something that we do, and that will lead us to some kind of understanding of where to start from, some, some kind of commitment. Reflection can happen, reflection can be done uh, privately, we can reflect on the words privately, we can also do it uh, collectively. So I think um, food is going to arrive very soon, before it arrives, what I think we should do is do some kind of group reflection. So collectively thinking about what we just heard, what it means, okay, just to reflect. and. With that reflecting, you might have some questions and if there's somebody with you who has the answer, they can share the answer, if they don't, you can say your questions and ask later on. And while you're reflecting, asking questions, the next thing we should be doing is making some commitments, thinking, okay, what do we take back from this, what should I, where should I start from, what should we do? Okay. So this is a, a basic structure of how we might be able to have some kind of group reflecting session. Okay. Now, amongst us, mashallah, we have some Imams, some Ulama, some Qurra, some teachers. But you don't have to be with any of them, okay? I think, you see, when we talk, when we talk about what we hear, when we talk about Deen, it builds our confidence. A lot of times we do the listening, but we, because we haven't spoken about it, we haven't made ourselves accustomed to mentioning those things in a casual way to our friends, to our siblings, to our parents, to our friends. That's why we haven't actually developed the confidence in those areas. So, before we start, um, let me just ask if anyone wants to volunteer to share some thoughts on one of us 
speech. Anyone under 20, I would say. I don't want to point at anyone, otherwise you'll be put on the spot. <laughs> Feel free. Um, just, um, just uh, who, who wants to just mention any one or two points they remember? Um, I think I'm going to have to put someone on the spot. As well. Um, under 20. I'm not under 20 because I put no problem. Question. Um, basically, it's just a question that I got. Um, you said about the heart. Um, how do you apply taqwa? Between the, how do you apply that? I mean, it's difficult to have taqwa. How do you, how do you take that? Yeah. How do you apply that? Like when you said about the alcohol, they gave up straight away. So, but how do you apply it to yourself? How do you, you know? Um, yeah, very, very, you want very, to do it? You want yeah. To do it. yeah, very good question. What I think is, once we go into the groups, I'm sure many of us will be able to share their own experiences on how they were able to um, be steadfast on taqwa at points or how they were able to develop it. At the end, maybe we might take question and answers. So those kind, these kind of questions that may have arised during the speech, um, it would be good if we can share those with sitting amongst us, because not all things are necessarily um, something that needs to be referred to in terms of uh, rules of what's right and what's wrong in terms of answers. There are some, there are sometimes many correct answers. It's all about what helped us in our lives and what we need to do in order to move forward and what things what challenges we are facing where are we stuck see everyone's facing different situations so but yes there are very clear um, guidances in, in the Quran in terms of development taqwa um, can I ask anyone else um, do, you, uh, do you remember anything from what Zakaria, anything from Brian? Okay, I think that's why, um, that's one of the reasons why we want to split you into groups. Okay, it'll be much easier, much more comfortable. Yes, Sheikh. Yeah, how to develop taqwa, how to purify our hearts. So, um, if we can have, um, if you just spread us, so one small group in that corner with Moran Atif, yeah? um, those who are sitting on this side of the pillar, um, in front, let's go with Moran Atif, behind the pillar in that corner with Moran Shabir, okay? um, on this side of the pillar with Moran uh, Muhammad Hussein Qadi, yeah? And then whoever's on that side of the pillar with Marana Mizan. Okay. And then um, Marana Farouk um, can go in that corner. And some of you brothers here can come forward with Marana Hashim. Um, just, just, just spread out a bit. Um, inshallah, food is coming very soon. 